We are back with the Twisted History Podcast, Barstool Sports. And this one is going to be the Twisted History of Wine. A couple of people have written in and said they, they know that I like wine. Um, so why not do a Twisted History of Wine? And I said, if you ask for it, I'll do it. Where is it on your uh, Pantheon? I have Jeff in the house, Jeff Vibbert, uh, to my immediate right. I have straight across me, uh, St. Anne. And straight across me this way is uh, Johnny back from, uh, from all his uh, various trips. Um, very high in demand, Johnny. Um, where is wine for you, Jeff, as far as booze goes? Oh, it is very low. Very on low. On my scale. I'm not a wine guy. It's like the last alcohol I would reach for. Where, where do you drink it? Uh, if I go to an Italian restaurant. That's it? Yeah. Really? <clears throat> or if it's like a, yeah. If a girl opens an entire bottle and she's like, I don't want to drink this alone. I'm like, all right, fine. I'll have a glass. Red or white? Uh... Uh, it uh, it's so rare for me to drink wine that it doesn't really doesn't really matter. Really? I'd like a rosé because it's the least wine tasting. It's like a you don't like the taste of wine. Not really. Yeah, I, I think wine like a merlot is too dry. Right. Uh, it's like it just it tastes <laughs> like you're just I don't know I don't like it it just kind of stays on your teeth and tongue. I'm very uncultured when it comes to drinking because I don't like wine. I mean people like what they like. I mean yeah. I get a lot of shit for not drinking scotch. I don't have yeah, a I, I don't have a stomach for scotch. I, I don't I mean, think anyone has a palate for scotch. It's I don't know. it's like I see Ray it's Donovan. Rough. Like when Ray Donovan pours that glass of scotch after mm-hmm. a tough day, like he beats somebody with a baseball bat and he like savors it. I'm jealous. Like I'd like oh, to be Ray Donovan. I would love to to be able to do that 100%. I just watched the Irishman last night or well Part Over of it last nights, night, yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, he, whenever he, he gets back from a, a, a kill, a hit, he just starts chugging the, the scotch, and he's just like shaking with his hands, like ah, right. just to calm his nerves. A glass of scotch, that'd be nice. So I'm a big wine drinker. I'm a big wine. I, mm-hmm. I drink. I drink yeah. quite a bit of it. I think I drink more wine than anything else. I drink more wine than I drink beer. I drink more wine than I drink spirits. I'm a big vodka guy too, vodka and gin. Mm-hmm. So this one is near and dear to me. John, do you wino? Yeah, I like wine. You do, right? I like red wine. Open it up at home and stuff? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cabernets, Italian reds. Okay. Do you like yeah, how I you like how I slid in there? If a girl opens a bottle of wine. Yeah, I know. Guys don't know. drink wine. Yeah, we're we're drinking bottle. beer and whiskey. What Come on now. Um, we're gonna find something that you're gonna drink today. We're gonna and I know Annie is it's not as big of a wino as me, obviously, but if we open up a bottle uh, between the two of us, it never nuts. Like it's always should we open another. That's our biggest problem. Mm-hmm. And typically we do. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about wine. I'm going to talk to you about history wine. I'm going to talk to you about people who've gotten fucked by wine. I'm going to talk to you about a whole bunch of stuff today, so strap in. Wine can be made out of just about anything that contains sugar, and if there isn't enough sugar, it can always just be added in the, uh, in the winemaking process. So uh, fruit wine or country wine is made throughout the world with whatever resources are at hand. Plum wine is made from fermented plums in a manner similar to the way that apple cider is made from apples. And plum wine, people tend to think about it being Chinese, but it's also associated with the North Cotswolds, an area in South Central England, which has nothing in common with South Central Los Angeles. There's pomegranate wine that is big in Israel, and it's it's marketed everywhere as uh, Ramon, so pomegranate wine. Pineapple wine is like a soft, dry fruit wine, and it's popular in Thailand and other Southeast Asian countries. There's dandelion wine, not even a fruit, but dandelion petals that are mixed with sugar and combined with some sort of acid like a lemon juice. It's usually made at home. You can get dandelion wine in a lot of people like hippies' homes. But there are a couple of people that make it, including a winery in the Garden State, New Jersey, Belleville, Bellevue Winery in New Jersey, it's down somewhere in like Atlantic County. They make a dandelion wine. Red currant, white currant fruit wines. Um, usually grown like northern cool areas where it's tough to grow oh, well, like high quality grapes uh, cherry wine cherry wine is pretty popular it's usually made with tart cherries which is good for my gout cherry wines can also be used to make uh, fortified wines and liqueurs Michigan Michigan is where you find most of your cherry wines they're the leading tart cherry producing region of the United States and they also make a couple of cherry grape blends, a couple of cherry spiced wines. So cherry wines, big in Michigan. Cherry Kijafa is something a little bit different. Cherry Kijafa has got a little bit more alcohol than your average bottle of wine. I think it's somewhere around 16 or 18%. It's a fortified wine and it comes from Denmark. So every now and again, you'll go to some place that has a Nordic flair and you can have something called Cherry Kijafa, typically as like a dessert type thing. 
Uh, there you, was a. Have you that? tried all those wines? I've tried. So I've done cherry kijafa, one hundred percent. I've had cherry wine mm-hmm. many times. I've had dandelion wine. I haven't had pomegranate. I haven't had pineapple. Anything with the current. There's this guy in Quebec. His name is Pascal Miche. He used to be a butcher, and he sells wine called Omerta. Sounds like the uh, the Italian word for like mafia, but it's actually a family name for him. He's just some guy from Quebec, and he makes tomato wine, which I've never tried. It's been on the market since 2010. He sold over 100,000 bottles. Omerta. Um, what is dandelion wine? Tastes like is it is it so that's like a whole normal thing. white wine because I looked it up and it looks like a, a white wine. Yeah, so it, so what happens is, is it all depends on how sweet they go with it. So it like the winemaking process. So with a dandelion wine, for example, you have like more of a floral bouquet. It's not bullshit, and you you can see like floral bouquets on gins. Like mm-hmm. gin is the place where I tell people make sure they smell that. Like even though it's a neutral liquor, you don't really got to smell a vodka before you drink it, but you can really smell like the. Um, like the, the, the floralness yeah. off of a gin. And a dandelion wine, too, has like a big nose to it. And on top of it being like a – you can't drink a lot of it. Mm-hmm. You can't drink a lot of it because it will kill you. I looked up the tomato wine, and it's not like a, a Bloody Mary. It's not like that red thick. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it looks like an actual like white wine with a tint of red maybe. It says it takes all the tomato flavor out of it. Mm-hmm. So the winemaking pro- – in Tanzania, banana wine is made. From my mash ripe bananas. That sounds disgusting to yeah. me. I try it. Like, I try all these things. 100%. But the, it, there's ones that are made uh, with lychee almost exclusively in China. Strawberries, watermelons, peaches, blackberries, gooseberries, boysenberries, grapefruit, pears, persimmons, raspberries. All have wines. Right? The ancient Mayans had a particular kind of wine called pulque, which was made from the fermented sap from a cactus and it was so harsh, the way they imbibed it was pretty intense. According to records, they gave it to themselves uh, using enemas while visiting ritual caves that were viewed as portals to the dead. So everything else seems kind of right down the middle. You get something sweet, you either make it sweeter or not, you ferment it, you have wine. The ancient Mayans took it to a little bit of a bigger degree by making it from something, the sap of a cactus, and then shoving it up their asses. You know what I mean? But the Mayans tend to go hard with that shit. Yeah, you gotta, you got to get it directly in the bloodstream. But my point is, you can make it out of just about anything. But by far, the most popular fruit to produce wine and the most suitable for the winemaking process is grapes, right? So if you can do it for all this stuff, and there's all these regional you know, biases towards different fruits and vegetables, right? Is cactus a vegetable? It might be for I have no fucking clue. But it's grapes. Grapes are number one with the bullet. First off, because they have a higher concentration of sugar. Around twenty percent. Sweet. Think, I think a cactus would be a fruit because it's got like flowers. It's got to be right. Yeah, but the, the seeds are in the end. It's a succulent. Yeah, I believe it's succulent. If you're a if you're a botanist, let us know. <laughs> yeah, please reach out. So big uh, concentration of sugar in grapes. That's one thing that makes them great. Almost more than any other fruit, and that's important because a higher concentration of sugar allows you to make more alcohol from what you're distilling. And aside from the obvious reason to love more alcohol in your wine, a higher alcohol content is better for uh, preservation, shelf life. So all these other things that I'm going to tell you about that's not grape wine typically has a very short shelf life. Mm -hmm. I have a a, a bottle of orange wine sitting on on a shelf probably for the last two years that I'm sure is probably not good anymore. So shelf life is important and higher alcohol content helps that. And all those other wines have to be uh, drank young because they tend to spoil fast. Also, grapes contain the least amount of pectins. So if you look at something like an apple, which is high in pectins, if your dog ever eats an apple, the dog takes a dump and it's kind of jellyish. That's because of the pectins inside of an apple. So grapes don't have as many. When my dogs poop, I will I get when I get down to Do you pick watch it up, I, I I look at it, I inspect it. it you got to make sure they're healthy and There's I two types of people in the world. Yeah, people are. who look and people who don't. Oh, I I have to I have to know if they're all right. It's a it's, it's Now, if it's a maternal paternal type thing, yeah. I'm okay with it. Oh, if I see a strange dog pooping on the on the sidewalk, I give it space like, "Hey, I'm Good. So, I do you, but no, I'll, I'll get down right. and I'll, I'll – mm, what's that? Is that a tapeworm? What that? is that? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That means you're going to be a good father. It, you got to look. You check your dog's poop. When I don't know what camera to look at, but check your dog's poop. 
<laughs> it's it's so it could be a lifesaver. Make sure you hit both cameras on that because it's important. Hey, check your dog's poop. All right. So less pectins inside of grapes. When you're squeeze, uh, squeezing a fruit for juice, pectins are what allow all the bits of fruit to stay on top and float in small pieces. Grapes not having a ton of pectins allow for the juice to run clearer, not pulpy. This is unique to grapes, and since back in ancient times they didn't have advanced filtration systems, this made grapes the fruit of choice for making wine. Then there's the acids. All fruits are acidic. We know that. But grapes have a specific acid that is rare, and that is tartaric acid. This is good because microorganisms do not like tartaric acid. They cannot metabolize it. They cannot break it down. Bacteria cannot feed on it. Therefore, it does not easily grow in wine. Plus, the alcohol content also prevents bacterial growth. So, there are very specific acidic bacteria that can transform alcohol into vinegar. We've all had bottles of wine go bad on us before, or perhaps not, but I certainly have. But that's one in thousands, and it's usually prevented through the winemaking process. Without all this bacterial growth, wine can stay very stable for a long period of time. Grape wine, for a long period of time. And then finally, just the ease of growth. Grape vines can grow just about anywhere. And although grapes are 80% water, grapevines do not need that much water to grow, and the soil they're growing from does not need to be that rich. That's one of the reasons that wine is so broadly made. You can grow a grapevine just about anywhere. Yeah, every state has a winery now. 100%. Yeah, it's not 100%. just like uh, California. Yeah. Uh, grapevines essentially can be planted anywhere. They'll take all the water from whatever soil they're in, soak it up, and they'll create these little delicious dumplings of sugar. The wine is made with grapes, but not with the typical table grapes that can be bought at the supermarket. I don't know if you've ever, have you ever had wine making grapes? I have not. You See, look, at, you're going to learn a lot today. It, it, until like fifth grade, I didn't, learn a lot I didn't know there were seeds in grapes. Until I went over to a friend's house for a sleepover and he didn't have as much money as we did. And there were <laughs> seeds in his grapes. <laughs> we had seedless grapes at my house. Of course you did. You were the Vibses. Yeah. You were the Vibses of northern Indiana. Were you northern Indiana? Yeah. Okay. Northern Indiana. It's yeah. a great place to yeah. be. Yeah. Went to college there. Uh, <laughs> wine grapes are smaller. They're sweeter. Um, they have very thick skins because the yeast from the skins is good in the fermentation process. Lots of juice and numerous seeds. Like, so winemaking grapes have numerous seeds. Table grapes, particularly in the Vibs household, are more physically eye-catching. They have less juice, though. Sexier grapes. <laughs> more pulp, <laughs> less acidity, and less sugar. And they also have thinner skins for your sensitive teeth. I, I will say this as well. I didn't like grapes for the longest time because they reminded me of spider butts. The abdomen oh. of a spider. It's just kind of... Yes. I have a good imagination, large, and <laughs> yeah. it ran wildly right. as a child. So in this podcast, we, we talked about agriculture in different periods of history and how certain crops like corn, wheat, uh, potatoes, when we did the Irish uh, potato famine, uh, tobacco, um, we did Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, they changed whole civilizations and ecosystems. But you have to imagine way back in ancient times, grapes were pretty fucking magical. With a little help, they transformed this incredible tasting drink that made people feel good, right? You felt drunk and provided nutrition at the same time. Grapes are high in calories and you need to drink seven glasses of orange juice or 20 glasses of apple juice in order to get the same amount of antioxidants in one glass of red wine, right? Mm -hmm. And the caloric intake was not important for me. It was important back then. A lot of people trusted wine more than they trusted their own drinking water and it was chock full of antioxidants as it still is, right? And what's the best thing that you can have with a glass of wine? What's the, what's the greatest thing that you can have with a glass of wine? Don't answer it because I'm just a segue. It's a home-cooked meal. We have a new sponsor, and it's called Every Plate. So what Every Plate is, it's one of these ones that sends you food to your house to cook. There are a couple of services that do this. A lot of them are like vacuum-packed, pre-made meals. I'm not crazy about that. So when we had the opportunity to get in bed with these guys, I jumped on it. And what they do is they send you everything that you need to cook a simple meal, and they do it at a much lower price po uh, point than I've seen in any other home delivery system. So we've gotten like uh, boneless, skinless chicken breast, um, uh, chopped meat, tenderloin steaks, all this stuff, carrots, potatoes, a couple of packets with some seasonings, but nothing over the top. Nothing that's going to be making you shit shoestrings within a couple of hours, which is something that... Like, uh, what's his name? Mincy is doing these pre-made meals. I just talked to him about these pre-made meals in the kitchen yesterday. No joke. And he's putting these things it, in, and it's like, 
a salmon teriyaki. He's put it in the in the uh, microwave here at work. It's blowing out the second floor, worse than anything that you bring on lowering the bar. It looks disgusting, too. I said, Mincy, are those good? And he's like, uh, you know, Mincy, he's a goat. He's, oh, yeah. yeah, I can take them. So yeah. these, this is not this. So every plate is, they send you recipe cards, pre-portioned ingredients, so you can spend less time prepping and cooking, more time enjoying your food. It takes out any kind of trips to the grocery store, which, by the way, sucks nowadays. I love going to the grocery stores. The aisles are bare. There's nothing there. So for you to have somebody who says, listen, I have a meal that is good for you, it's a great price, and it's easy to make, and I'm sending it to you. You don't have to worry about all of a sudden stop and shop being out of carrots. Jump on it. And you're going to be able to jump on it for a price that's absolutely fucking obscene. You can choose between 17 recipes that change each week, swap out proteins, veggies, and sides all to your liking. All righty? So we're looking at affordable, hearty, delicious, and family-pleasing meals. How do you get it? How do you get it? You can try every plate for just $1.79 per meal. $1.79 per meal. That's not a young Vibs's. Like, Mrs. Vibs would scoff at that. For for a, for a dollar seventy nine, you can give young vibs a meal. <laughs> yeah, you can no. feed young vibs. So you go to everyplate.com, e v e r y p l a t e dot com, and you enter the code twisted one seventy nine. Give it a shot, right? You get started with every plate for just a hundred. Excuse me, one dollar and seventy nine cents per meal. Go to everyplate.com and you enter the code twisted one seven nine. That's that's a huge value. I'm telling you right now, you're going to be shocked with how much food they send to you for how little of a price. So give it a try. It's every plate, particularly if you're a single guy, because you don't have to have anything but perhaps hot sauce in your fridge. And you order this, they give you everything you need. All you need is a plate and a pot, which you have. I have that. A plate, a pot, yeah. and a pan. Maybe some butter. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So that's every plate. They're new for us. All right. So when I started this, I always like to do some freaky shit. Like, is there a serial killer that just used wine? used to soak people in wine, perhaps impale women on wine bottles. Like, you want to get real dark with mm-hmm. it. So every time you go through the Googling process before you do a podcast, you do that type of stuff. Uh, killer wine, biggest crimes. Every Google search that I did took me back to this goddamn bottle of wine. It took me back to this 19 crimes. It seems like... The people who set up this wine, and it's a wine that's based in Australia, Mm -hmm. they have the Google searches 100% down because everything with wine and shadiness leads you to try and buy this bottle. I'm a testament to it because I just tried to spend, you know, countless hours trying to find stuff that was shady with wine. So it's called 19 Crimes. I have it here. I haven't drank on this show too much, uh, so I'm going to do it today. It's called 19 Crimes because there are 19 crimes that existed in England that made people eligible to get shipped off to Australia Mm -hmm. when it was a prison colony. Right. There was 19 of them. So the idea behind this is that when you pull the cork, you get a crime. Like this one, I have a crime number 17. Watermen carrying too many passengers on Thames, if any, drown. Like there's very specific crimes that led you to get essentially deported from England and so the 19 crimes highlights them. And then they also have some stupid app. This isn't a this isn't an ad at all. I just found it fascinating. Mm-hmm. They have some stupid app which I uh, which I found and you just scan the bottle and the prisoner on the face of the bottle then talks to you and gives you like the story of what he did and whatnot. And then of course they bash this is the Shiraz. This is my favorite grape. The Syrah, a Syrah grape whenever it's grown in Australia is called a Shiraz. It's the same grape. They bastardized this bottle, and they brought in Snoop Dogg. So 19 Crimes also has a Snoop Dogg one, whereas if you scan him, he's like, for shizzle, uh, toast to the new yizzle. Like, it's terrible. Yeah. When you <laughs> yeah. log on to their website, it's Snoop. It's like Snoop Dogg, and you have to say your, what your age is. You have to yes. confirm your age, and Snoop Dogg is helping you. Yeah. So. And now they have, they just signed up Martha Stewart, too, because she's obviously an ex-con. Right. right. So she's like a rosé. So... Anyway, it's 19 crimes. Johnny, do you want to try this? Sure. A little bit? Annie, you want to try a little bit? I do. Yeah. Also, don't I've forget Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg are BFFs. They are BFFs, yeah. They are. So and I they're wanted both felons. To, 
I wanted to circle back real quick to your cactus. The cactus is a plant that's also a fruit and a vegetable. Oh, okay. all right. We can't See both that? be right. Look at that. Just Participation you know. trophy. I will tell you right now the price point on this wine, and this it's isn't going to be a big wine a tasting. So we never hold cheers. it. We never hold a wine glass by the bulb because you don't want to heat up the wine with your fingers. Right. So always hold it by the stem. Uh, Do you have a toast for us? Give it a little bit. Give it a little bit of this. What's that? Sure, I got a toast. I don't mind it. No, that smells good. Nine ninety nine. This is a twenty eighteen. And it's it's relatively horrible. Ah, that's that's not very good. Twenty eighteen Shiraz. Yeah, the twenty eighteen Shiraz, not very good. It needs a little needs to breathe a little bit. Yeah, perhaps it needs Let's something. Circle back in about an yeah, hour. So nineteen crimes. <laughs> um anyway, so wine. Uh what's the toast? Uh staying positive, testing negative. That's what everyone does there nowadays, yeah. This thing does have like a little It's very fruity. Timeline. The timeline yep, for wine. That's wine. It's, uh, you don't like that. <laughs> yeah, that tastes. That's that's the reason you don't like wine. It's not smooth. Uh, it's uh, Yeah, it's just, what is that taste? I don't know what that taste is. You know what you I mean? You have a little burn in the back of your throat? How do I describe throat? that? Uh, is it too tart? Falls flat on your tongue? Falls flat on your tongue. Yeah. I tell you what, too. If I go out and I have wine with people, I can convince them. Like, fall flat on your tongue is popular, so I, I, yeah. I didn't do that to you. But I can convince them that there's stuff there. Like, you know, t- can you taste a little See, bit of leather, a little bit of tobacco? I feel like this tastes a lot like grapes, though. Like, you can really taste the grapes. This isn't, this. yeah. This one isn't as flat as most. I like, have s- you ever had Manischewitz? I have. That's that, like full-on grape juice. That you can have, like, three sips of, and it's, like, too much. But it, I, I like that better. You like yeah. that better? I, I like the just, like, a well, eh, it's too fruity. Yeah, I don't really like Manischewitz. There are some know, people who mix uh, Coca-Cola and wine. Have you ever done that? That's, that's an insane person move. Where, is that like a, a, is that a southern, southern thing? thing? Yeah. I don't think it's a Jinx. southern thing. I think it. Because uh, like I only a, say that because Southern Comfort is not that, but it is like that idea, I feel like. Coca Cola is from Atlanta, so I just figured the South, like, yeah. they always try to put Coke in stuff. Yeah, that's true. And then the oh, deep, deep South loves Coke. Yeah. Coca Cola so, and like ice cream. Yeah. Cali Mazzo. It's a Spanish cocktail. With red wine and Coke. And it's from the culture that drinks a lot of sangria. Do you know what I mean? But they mix red wine and Coke, and it's called Cali Moxo. I've yeah. had it. I, th- I think it's it's not bad. And I've done stuff, too, where I've had glasses. I always have a Coke with an Italian meal. Sometimes I'll pour a little bit of red wine into the glass at the end. So I'm, I'm guilty of it. I'm a fat guy, I guess. I can see the tannins swimming in my <laughs> In the pectins? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So how far back does wine go? I'm going to go real quick. Uh, China. 7,000 B.C., so that's about 9,000 years ago, in the Henan province. Clay jars from the early Neolithic period were used to create and store a fermented drink made with wild grapes, rice, honey, and something called hawthorn fruit, which I've never heard of before. Evidence suggests that these alcoholic beverages were used in burial and religious ceremonies. So the first time wine pops up on the uh, archaeological map is 7,000 B.C., and then in 2016... A group of people found a cave in Armenia that they think was the oldest winery. They thought it was a winery because it had a grape press, multiple jars. They determined that the wine that was in it was this Vitus vinifera, which is one of the um, one of the mother grapes that all of the grapes have uh, have derived from, and it's be closest to a Merlot, and it's the same that's used in most wines today. So it's the first winery was sixty one hundred BC, so nine hundred years. After the Chinese were discovered to have drank wine, the Armenians started to press and sell it. I know, I know Chinese wine is starting to make a, a big jump on the market. Granted, they have billions of people, but the area where they grow in China is very similar to France and Southern California, mm-hmm. or California, where they grow all the wine. Uh, so yeah, it's making a big, big jump. Chinese the, wine. The problem with Chinese wine is that there's demand, mm-hmm. right? Chinese people want to drink more wine, and so the Chinese said, we'll grow it. We'll grow our own wine. And the Chinese people have turned their nose up to it. They're more traditionalists that like to drink stuff from the continent. Yep. Tra- a traditional... Uh, old world? A- Italian. Yeah, old world. Exactly. Yeah. So 100%. It's ancient world. So John's. So to John's point, ancient world is Armenia, China, all these places that found wine first. They're mm-hmm. called ancient world. And those types of wine do not exist anymore. Yeah. I'll go down the timeline to where it hits old world, and then that's your France, Italy, Germany. And then the new world is obviously after all the conquistadors started to go around and planting uh, fields wherever they were like raping women. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like like 
uh, the the label is huge. Like uh, you want to Abercrombie is massive. It's yes. not necessarily a better product, but Abercrombie. Oh, it's one hundred percent. Yeah. So no one wants Chinese wine. They want the French Italian wine. So that's why this place that has um, all this varied terrain. Do you know what I mean? I'm sure they have terrains that are similar to the mountains where we're growing Pinot Noir in Oregon and Washington. Right. But they're not taking off because people in China have more of a palate for American wines. Yep. Or they think they do. Uh, we'll talk yeah. about that too. Like book by its cover. Don't judge a book by its cover. Wine shoots that out of the fucking – out of the water. Mm. I, I buy wines oh, yeah. 60% because of their cover, because of their label. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And by the way, it's all a scam. We're going to talk about that. Mm. Wine yeah, is good. a 100% scam. I mean, this isn't a good. This isn't a good bottle of wine. It's not. It just no. isn't. But it's not terrible. But I could be convinced that it's a good bottle of wine. But the right person, like, uh, you know what I mean? It's such a goddamn scam. We're gonna get into all yeah. that shit. I also think this actually tastes fresher than I've it's had. It's cold. It's cold, which yeah. helps. But it also like sometimes damage can happen. Like if it's sitting out in the sun, like a, a wine like this will get really affected. I don't like room temp. Skunks it. I yeah. always like to take a little bit of the room off. Yeah. I throw even the greatest wines that I have, and I'm talking about like $40, $50 bottles, I throw them in the fridge for a little bit too. I, I just like my wine a little I, bit cold. That's, I think that's why I don't like red wine. It's, it's always like room temp, and it's like, why, are we, why would we want to drink room temp wine? Right, um, right. You know? That's silky. I want, I want that cold beer after a long day. Yeah. I'm going to drink this whole bottle, but it's still, <laughs> I, it just doesn't agree with me yeah, as much. Yeah, yeah. So we already have our first winery. We're at our first wine. 3,000 years later, Ancient Egypt joins in, 3100 B.C. They have wine that's stored in amphoras, those clay jars with the narrow neck and two handles that you see all the time in, you know, in like tombs and whatnot. Yep. And because red wine resembled blood, ancient Egyptians had many superstitions about its power, including its link to the blood of Osiris, the god of resurrection. And although red wine was the most common type of wine produced in this region— Amphoras discovered in King Tut's tomb was the first evidence of white wine ever being produced. So King Tut might have been the first guy to drink white wine. Hammurabi's Code. We've talked about Hammurabi's Code a couple of times. And Hammurabi's Code was this ancient set of laws that were set forth. And it's there's dozens of them. But Hammurabi's Code in 1800 BC had an interesting law about wine. Fraudulent wine sellers were to be punished by being drowned in the river. Hammurabi's Code always gave out very specific punishments for very specific crimes. And back in 1800 BC, if you were a guy selling fake wine, changing labels and whatnot, yep. and caught, you were to be drowned in a river. Which, so it's a big deal. Which is a big problem in France right now because of what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. The France label is so great and so well known that like people in Italy, bottles in Italy will put like the Eiffel Tower on it. Right. Italian wines will use the Eiffel Tower to sell the illusion that it's a, a French wine. Yeah, I, I think it's it's so easy to do that. Cheese, wine, any kind of luxury good. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Call something champagne that's not made in you know champagne region of France. Like people tend to do that, but some of the other stuff that people do that's straight up forgery, mm -hmm. straight up meticulous forging, like they were forging you know hundred dollar bills, is amazing. And they are extremely successful. I'm going to give you a bunch of uh, examples in just a little bit. So we went to Egyptians, the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians, I mentioned, only because they started the wine trade. So they started to move the beverage and the grapevines themselves across the Mediterranean. During their travels, they came in contact with Jews who began using wine as part of religious ceremonies. In the Bible, the first mention of wine appears in the book of Genesis, so right in the beginning, when Noah drinks it after the great flood. He deserved it. Noah got kicked back with a nice little... Load all those animal animals Absolutely. Up. So thanks to the Phoenicians, the ancient Greeks began drinking wine and using it as a symbol for religion, trade, and health. Wine was so beloved in ancient Greece that they named a god after it, Dionysus, Right. As the Greek city-states began to spread throughout the Mediterranean, so did wine production. Like the Phoenicians, Greeks would transport grapevines. They introduced the Vitis vinifera, I've already mentioned that grape already, uh, to new colonized areas, including Sicily, before eventually making their way to Rome. So we went Egyptians, we went Phoenicians, now we're going Romans. And by 100 BC, we're almost up to modern times, Mimicking the Greeks, Greeks, the Romans created their own god of wine. The Greeks had Dionysius, the Romans had Bacchus. 
The Romans fine-tuned the Greek process of viniculture using barrels and other techniques that helped them produce more at a quicker pace and lower cost. So the Romans made it better. Wine was a daily part of life for Romans. So unlike the pharaohs of Egypt, this drink of the gods was easily accessible to both the rich and the poor. And as the Roman Empire grew across Europe, they planted grapevines in European countries, including modern-day France, the rest of Italy, Spain, Germany, and Portugal, which is essentially Old World. So by the time we reached 1 AD, where everyone had to turn their clocks over, their calendars over, the ancient Chinese, the Greeks, the Phoenicians, the Egyptians, the Jews, and the Romans all adopted wine into their culture, right? By the time we turn those calendars over, almost everybody had it. Fast forward 300 more years, and when Constantine the Great began his reign, the Catholic Church and Christianity became the primary, primary religious force in the Roman Empire. And with it, wine took a prominent place in religious rituals, specifically during the Sacrament of the Eucharist, I turn my body into bread, my blood into wine. Uh, you know, he does the whole Last Supper thing. He multiplies the loaves and the fish, all that stuff. Wine became an absolute centerpiece for Christianity somewhere around 300 A.D. Okay, so now wine is, is permanently affixed into every major culture that existed in the ancient world. Okay, now we're going to come into the modern world. 1492 to the 1600s. We, we know about this because that's when uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, mm -hmm. right? That, that's 1492, he sailed the ocean blue. That was Columbus. Yeah. Not, uh, why don't we replace uh, Christopher Columbus with Lewis and Clark in Sacagawea? I feel like that was a more I think, you discovering know America expedition than I think after last Columbus. week, we did give them a whole bunch. But I think the idea of coming over, setting foot, on these two continents it, without anybody there. It was already discovered. Yeah, yeah I get, get that. Get but. like a Vasco da Gama, Amerigo Vespucci, like mm -hmm. somebody like mm -hmm. that, and then move Christopher Columbus out. But, you know, again, like, and, and we say this all the time, I, I I hope people learn about Christopher Columbus. Yeah. You know, maybe, you know, you don't put him on dish towels, right? <laughs> yeah. Or, or stuff yeah, like I, that, but, but still. My point is we still have, as it a, as... It's a government holiday. We still get the day off. How about we just bump Christopher Columbus? And oh, say, Lewis but then Clark again, I, I guess now it's now it's uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to bump Indigenous Peoples Day. You're damn right. Is now I'm canceled. Doing? I just canceled myself. <laughs> Holy Fuck. shit! But I no, I yeah. <laughs> I don't know anything about uh, Amerigo Vespucci, but I wonder if he's secretly happy because maybe he's got some skeletons in the closet and he's like, thank it, yeah, God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Quite, that yeah. was close. Bad guy, from what I understand. Great name, bad guy. So we have this new area of exploration, which we talked about with Donnie does right. So North and South America becomes uh, invaded, essentially, by Spanish conquistadors who come to Mexico, Brazil, and they brought with them European grape cultivation. And during this time, wine production spread widely across South America. South America has perfect conditions for growing most grapevines. And so wine was brought over to the New World by Spanish conquistadors. Then Portuguese Jesuits traveled the opposite way to Japan, to spread the word of Catholicism in the mid-1500s, and they brought wine with them. Interestingly enough, though, it took 300 years before the first vineyard would be planted in Japan. So the Jesuits brought it uh, east to Japan, the Jesuits, and then the conquistadors brought it west to the New World. That's weird. The Chinese never took that little voyage to Japan. They said, fuck br you. Bring wine. We're yeah. just doing our thing. Yeah. In the late 18th century, Spanish missionary Junipero Serra, he traveled to San Diego, California, where he established the state's first mission and first known vineyard. He's known as the father of American wine, this guy uh, Junipero Serra. The Spanish colonizers established Sonoma's first winery in 1805, and the Mission Grape was the only varietal grown in California until the 1830s. After that, other European settlers in Los Angeles added several European grape varieties to their vineyards. So uh, what we know now as the hotbed of wine globally uh, came into play in the uh, early 19th century, late 18th, early 19th century, when Junipero Serra uh, uh, traveled to San Diego, California and started to lay down some grapevines, right? So now we're talking about new world wines. Global exploration continued. Wine eventually spread to the far reaches of the globe, including Australia and New Zealand. And today, the only continent on the planet where vineyards do not exist is Antarctica. 
phone. I mean, that is that is a pandemic of sorts. You start growing grapevines and you start having people drink the fruit of the grape mm-hmm. and it grows and it spreads and it blossoms to an industry everywhere except for Antarctica. And grapes are now officially the most planted fruit all over the world. That's big, right? Great. This mm-hmm. So this Huge. is a big industry. A big fruit. Not that I need if, to convince you what we're doing is big. If, but if soccer is the world's game, wine is the world's drink. 100%. Right? More so than beer. I, You know, I said I drink more wine than anything else. When I sit down to drink beer, I'll drink a case. You know, like, so I think by volume, I drink more beer, but I drink wine more often. Well, if you're drinking those Michelob Ultras. Yeah, That's what I do. Yeah. I drink those light ones. Yeah, it's real light. Yeah. So, yeah. But I think I would, when I'm at home, I open up a bottle of wine Five times more than I would ever crack a beer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's Vibs, classy. I think, I think what you should do is you should go on a wine kick because when you go back to beer, your palate's changed, and then you're going to be like, oh, this I, – I think it makes beer taste better. Yeah, it makes it, – it, uh, it refines your palate. Yeah. Like if I, you move I on and come back to it, you're mm-hmm. like, whoa. One hundred percent. Break from smoking. I think it's one hundred percent true. <laughs> I don't know quite know about that. But yeah. I gotta I gotta take a break so I can get high so I can get more high. You know what you mean? You <laughs> I just thought get, you mean Oh over. no no no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can't wait to lose fifty pounds so I can get fucked up when I start drinking again. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I've said it myself a couple times. There, you know, yeah. The United yeah. States consumes the largest volume of wine of any country at thirty three million hectoliters as of two thousand twenty. At twenty four point seven million hectoliters, France is the second leading <laughs> consumer. Followed by Italy, Germany, and the UK, and then you got your uh, China coming up uh, from the rear. According to the Wine Institute, where I would love to work someday, Vatican City drinks the most wine per capita at 74 liters of wine per person per year. Tiny little Vatican City, they are downing wine, 74 liters a year. The popes love it. Remember the pope that used to oh. keep it around his neck? I'm going to talk about him. I'm, I'm absolutely going to talk about him. And whenever I talk about alcohol consumers, I can't help but mention Andre the Giant. So this is a small left turn. I've mentioned this before, but he's, he has to get his due. No one in recorded history could drink as much as Andre the Giant. You know this. Oh, yeah. You know I talk about him he, so goddamn. The, the picture of him holding a little tiny beer can. Oh, well, it's a normal beer can, but it absolutely. looks tiny in his massive hand. Passing out in a hotel lobby, them not being able to move him, so they took out a piano cover. And they just covered him as if he was a goddamn piano. Or dead. That's what they do. Absolutely. Dead people on the subway. Hello, lady. I, I, I love Andre the Giant. But I, I hated when he died. I had the graphic novel, Andre. It's a really cool little thing if you want to learn about his wife, his wife, his life in a, in a comic book form. Andre the Giant was just the guy. But he had a regular sized heart. That's stink. Mm. Eh, what can you do? No one in recorded history could drink as much as Andre. Don't come at me with that Wade Boggs bullshit. Wade Bo- uh, No. He stood seven foot five, weighed over five hundred pounds, and he routinely shocked friends and spectators with his insane tolerance for alcohol. These are the bullets, and you've heard them before. Maybe I don't care. He consumed, on average, seven thousand calories of alcohol a day. Seven thousand calories of alcohol a day. That's Just alcohol. Big. Yeah, yeah. He would routinely drink a twelve pack of beer before a wrestling match. Like I'm starting to get swollen from this little fucking 19 try. On road trips to wrestling matches, he would average a case of beer every 90 minutes. In one case, he consumed 16 bottles of plum wine before wrestling three matches shortly thereafter. The wine showed no discernible effect whatsoever. So he drank a case of beer in 90 minutes. That's separate. And he once had 16 bottles of plum wine before wrestling and was able to go through with the match without being noticed. He rarely drank enough to pass out, but one of the few times he did was after consuming, do the math on this, 119 beers in six hours. That's roughly one beer every three minutes nonstop for six hours straight. 119 oh, beers in six hours. That's, One beer every three minutes nonstop. We talk about power hours. I was just about to say that's power hour times oh, six. One beer every three minutes nonstop for six hours straight. When asked how much it took him to get drunk, Andre the Giant replied, it usually takes two liters of vodka just to – that's a terrible Andre. It usually takes two liters of vodka just to feel warm inside. Two liters of vodka. And for the record – that's over 50% more alcohol than what killed John Bonham, the drummer for Led Zeppelin. Mm-hmm. I mean, that guy Bonzo, he was with it, which he drank over a 24-hour period. Andre would take down two liters of vodka just to start to feel warm inside. 
I love Andre the Giant so much. I would like to have a picture of him and me hanging above my mat- mantle. Oh. That's something that I would love. I would, I would think about that picture forever. I'd, and I know iconic. just the place to get it done. PaintYourLife.com. You can get a professional hand-painted portrait created from any photo or photos at a truly affordable price. So you can combine photos of you and loved ones and have it done all in one painting. You can choose from a team of world-class artists and work with them until every detail is perfect. Oh, I want Andre's head tilted a little bit more towards me. I want to see him a little bit more lovingly. Put his, put his hand on my chest. 100% like Chief. It's fast. <laughs> you can receive your portrait in as little as two weeks. You can send any picture of yourself, your children, Andre the Giant, a cherished pet, and you can send it off to them, and they will make the perfect birthday anniversary or wedding gift. It's guaranteed. And now as a limited time offer, you can get 20% off your painting. That's right. You and Andre the Giant can be on a, a real deal oil painting, and you'll get 20% off with free shipping. I forgot that. I'm going to throw that in too. And to get this special offer, you have to text the word TWISTED, all caps, TWISTED, to this number, 64,000. Large, that's, that's weird. Just do it. 64000 is the phone number that you're texting the word TWISTED to. And with that, you'll start the process in getting a handmade painting of you and Andre the Giant for 20% off and with free shipping. That's twisted to 64000 Paint your life. Celebrate the moments that matters most, right? And again, twisted to 64000 I'm, I'm looking at the painting of you and Ann in it. Correct. It's, it's amazing. It's, I, it's, I had it yeah, done. Yeah, it's one of the best. I had it done. Um, I gave it to Annie as a gift. Then we went to our favorite restaurant, Arturo's in Midland Park, for my parents' birthday, 75 and 80 they turned respectively. So I hung it up uh, by the bathroom as a joke. Just so when my parents would go and use the facilities, they'd see it in the little lobby by the mm-hmm. bathroom. And the good people at uh, Arturo's, Mario and his mom and whatnot, Nicolina, they said, we're going to keep it up. And now I get this picture sent to me once a week by just different people who know me. They're like, yeah. what the fuck is it? Yes, and the picture so, I sent is not one I took. The one I sent uh, is one of the many that... Our friends have sent to us. <laughs> yeah, it's even so better. If this you one, nobody was it. in it. Usually they're posing with it. Yeah, and people it's pose in, with it. Yeah, it's, you know. Bring it's a big it, deal. Bring it to a party. Yeah, it's, it really it's a is. cultural icon. So we have that effect on people. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so <laughs> paintyourlife.com if you want to check this stuff out. Paintyourlife.com. But you can text TWISTED to 64000 and start that deal to get that picture made for you. And if you want to see it, how, how it looks, you know, really close up. Go to Arturo's in Midland Park, New Jersey. Um, wine bottles. This here is 750 milliliters. This is a typical bottle of wine. Yep. 750 milliliters, 13.5% alcohol. So th- that's what this is, 750 milliliters. A lot of people like to throw around the word like magnums and stuff like that. I'm going to tell you exactly what they are right now. I'm going to drop them. Do you know all this, John? Do you know sizes of bottles? Uh, no. Okay. Not, not as- there's a split, well. which is 187 milliliters. That's usually what people get when they order those champagne, Prosecco type things. They give you one that's essentially a glass. You ever see a wine bottle or a champagne bottle? It's just a glass. Oh, no, no. Yeah, if you go like a, a fancy a brunch. For Prosecco, it's actually nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you order something called a split, and it's 187 milliliters, 187 and a half milliliters. And it's a split. It's very small, and it just has one glass of booze in it. Yeah, if you or, mix it with mimosas, it's helpful. Yeah, 100%. So, uh, and it's also called, if you're doing it um, with Prosecco, it's called a piccolo. It's called a split here, but a piccolo in Italian. Then you have half bottles. You see a lot of half bottles, uh, you know, particularly in and around like airports and whatnot, half bottles. The 750 milliliter, which we're drinking now, is the standard. So, 750 milliliter, if you double that, a double bottle is called a magnum. It's just double the standard bottle. It's 1.5 liters. Then there's double magnums. Double magnums are awesome. Those are three liters. So a double magnum is four standard bottles, and it should give you 20 glasses of wine. So a double magnum is the large format. I like large format bottles of wine. Yeah. If I was going to, to, to a meal with myself, Annie, well, well, John and his wife, you and a significant other, I would bring a double magnum. Because I know we're doing 20, 20 glasses of wine. It's just cost effective. And it looks fucking awesome. Double magnums. Mm-hmm. Get one. Uh, after double magnums, there's the four and a half liter, which is six standard bottles of wine. That's called a Jeroboam. A Jeroboam, which is named after the first king of Israel for some reason. I don't know why. But that's 30 glasses of wine. 
After that, there's an imperial. Above that, there's a nine liter called the Salmanazar, which is named after an Assyrian king. I don't know why either. That's 12 bottles. Then there's the Balthazar, who was one of the wise men, one of the three wise men who visited Jesus and gave him gifts he didn't need. That's 16 standard bottles. And then the biggest one, there's a 15 liter. It's called a, it's, it's named after the king of Babylon, a Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah, so that's what it is. It's 15 liters. Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar. That's it. There you go. Yeah. It's Nebuchadnezzar. Thank you. Nebuchadnezzar. Son of a bitch. I'm so I'm trying to do the French. Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> the king of Babylon. 20 standard bottles and 100 glasses of wine within it. You order one of those, a Nebuchadnezzar, I never have because I can't even fucking pronounce it. Yeah. You are a baller. You're turning up. I'm turning up. I'm turning up. Maybe do 100 those, glasses. The sparklers. Yes. You do it at Bounce. Mm-hmm. Bounce Deuce or whatever. Corks. Let's talk about corks. Corks have been the preferred choice for closing wine since the 1400s. They used to seal them with like wax and whatnot into those earthen jars. But around the 1400s, they started to sell and store wine in glass bottles. And the best way to keep the wine inside the glass bottle was cork. It was a natural product, and it was malleable enough to hold the contents in place. You fast forward to today, and there are a unique set of pros and cons to natural cork. The pros of using cork corks is, again, they're naturally renewable. They're historically preferred. Some people, you know, thumb their nose up if they see a wine that has a screw top on top of it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, I have to, like, be the guy who's like, no, no, it doesn't matter. But it does. Part it looks of, cheesy. Part of the fun is popping the bottle in here and the One hundred percent pop, but yeah, yeah you get it. Terrible pop. That was like a, that was like a yeah, silent fart that you were trying to hold yeah, it. Yeah. You know? Then they have long term aging being proven. They've they've kept wine um, good for for centuries. The cons to cork is that they're expensive. They're about three times more expensive than being able to use something cheap like tin caps. One to three percent of all corked wines uh, get cork taint. That's when a chemical contaminant finds its way into your bottle, uh, usually by way of the cork. It's a limited natural resource. Even though it's a a natural resource, it's limited. There's different qualities to it, and natural corks breathe at variable rates. So there's reasons to use it, and there's reasons not to use it, but 3% of wines just go bad because of their corks. Screw caps have only been used since 1964, but they've rapidly become a larger share of the market. Almost all Australian wines, except for the one that I brought today, use screw caps. Yeah, so what's that, yellowtail bullshit? Don't they have, like, no cork down there? No, they do. But, I mean, I think they get some sort of, you know, like solar panelish deal yeah. if they use the screw it's caps. Like a natu- cork is like a natural resource, isn't yes, it? Yes. It's a natural resource that has a limited uh, that has limited resources. Right. So, yeah. So they, I think they, they reward them for using anything but. It's a more affordable... Uh, Option S- sustainable, sus- more sustainable. Yeah, one hundred percent. Except it's recyclable, but not biodegradable, right? So even though you are making caps, like that's two recyclable things. Put that in your bottles, and then the cap in your cans. Mm-hmm. People won't do that. They'll usually just throw the cap away. So it's not as good for the environment as far as that goes. And it's got that huge stigma that it's cheap wine. I don't know what the most expensive bottle of wine that has a screw cap on it, but I've never seen yeah. anything in that. I think it's an old world thing too. Because yeah, you're what right. Are, uh, you got to find out what's on. God bless you. We have to find out what's on the Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Always corks. On the Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Imagine showing up with that with a in, in a wagon from from Herentog. <laughs> oh, I can't stop thinking about Herentog. I love. That. that was one of my favorite ones out of all the holidays. Herentog was my favorite. So screw caps or corks. Right? Either one has their place, and you can argue about it. I really don't care. I'm sort of a cork guy, but one of the things that probably needs to go is the bottles themselves. We use a lot of glass bottles, and the idea behind it is that 90% of the wine that gets produced in the world, I'll say that again, 90% of the wine that gets produced in the world shouldn't last over a year and a half. It has a shelf life of about a year and a half. The rest of that 10% is what you see where you have like these 2018s and stuff. But the most of it's just shit that should be drank right away. That's the way that it is. So those wines should be in cans. They should be in plastic, which is normally bags inside of boxes. That's how they they pack them in plastic. Or they should be in milk cartons. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons that we can do it, and that's something that would be better for the environment, would be to get rid of bottles in stuff that's not going to have a shelf life. You can put this cheap bottle of wine in this 
and keep it for a year and a half, it's going to go bad anyway. Why not put it in a goddamn can? And if it's white wines or sparkling wines, cans get colder faster, so you can chill it up pretty fast. And if it's... Um, and if you don't want to do a full bottle, I've never had that problem. You can always just crack open a can of wine. Mm. I drink sake you're, in cans. I mean, you're pouring it anyways. You're pouring it into a wine glass. Yeah, right? I think so. But again, it's all traditionalism, right? Like, how do you feel if you were to come over to my house and I have this gigantic crown roast and we're doing like all these lavish side dishes and whatnot? And then I said, oh, who's for some wine? And I toss you a can of Cabernet. I would be aff- I would be disgusted. You would be disgusted. So wait, are you saying that it's mostly a myth that if I had like a 1996, I'll pick like a weird year, now that wouldn't that wouldn't have aged well? It would, it's like I should have drank that already. No, no. So those. So I'm, oh, I'm drinking it's, a two, okay. I'm drinking a 2018 right now. Right. And this is a piece of shit bottle. Like I said, it's 9.99. So yeah. In 2028, it's not going to be good. Right, 2028, it won't be good. It's not made to age, mm-hmm. but it's good now four years later. I'm saying outside of these, this is considered good. There's so much cheap wine being made, particularly organic wines that can't stay on. And organic wines can't stay on shelves because by definition, they don't have a lot of the stuff that keeps things from getting bacteria. Right. Mm-hmm. Organic wines, they're, they're gone in a year. Like when we had the Finnegan James, uh, my uncle had made a bottle named after my son. We bought cases and cases of it, but you know, if we didn't get to it right away, it just turned to vinegar. Gone. Yeah. You know, wow. won't get sick from it. Like that's a whole thing too with wine. Like if you open up a bad bottle of wine, you would see this red be uh, definitively more brown. Like you can just tell mm-hmm. by it. Then you got that smell of like wet cardboard. That's yeah. one of the things that turns you on. Or sulfur. If if all of a sudden it's like a cracked hard boiled eggs in there, no bueno. But also wet cardboard. This does seem very fresh. Yeah, it is very very fresh. Brand new. And again, I think like just put it in the fridge for a little bit, really livens it up. Talking a lot about wine today. I love that. Oh, New York State uh, Liquor Authority, the SLA, this week just unanimously approved a measure allowing movie theaters to serve wine and beer at their concession stands and moviegoers to carry the drinks inside the screening room. That's good. I like that. Before that, cinemas were allowed to serve drinks if they had a restaurant license alongside a full kitchen and waiters to serve the offerings to the patrons already seated. If you didn't have a full restaurant, as most movie theaters do not, Mm -hmm. and you did serve wine, technically the people who bought wine at your movie theater would have to drink it in the lobby. They couldn't bring it into the theater. So now no holes barred, you're allowed to drink wine in theaters now. If they got a liquor license, you're allowed to drink wine in theaters. And I like that. I will drink a bottle of wine watching a movie. And I will tell you one other thing. I think I mentioned it to you yesterday. Wine at a concert is, you know, I, I guess it's because I'm getting old. Because there's always beer and acid and weed and coke and mescaline, all that kind of stuff. Now we'd gone to see, what was it, St- Sting and Peter Gabriel. Mm-hmm. We saw them in the United Center in Chicago. And it was the first time I'd gone up to go get us a couple of beers. And as I was going there, there was like a stand where a guy was selling full bottles of wine, 750 milliliters, Mm -hmm. with two like plastic tumblers. Good bottle of wine. Like, okay, middle of the road type this. I grabbed it. We went back to the thing. And I just poured a full bottle of wine between she and I. And it was lovely. It's nice to eliminate trips. Yes. With a bottle, and you can just sit there and enjoy. And yeah, just, I think that's exactly right. It, 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 100%. it keeps the moment flowing. You have to break up the moment with, up. Oh, you want another one? I got to get another one. And everything that they sell in an arena goes well with wine. It's like all those cheese and bread salty, stuff. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Sal- yeah, salty and sweet. Hot dogs. And yeah, 100%. That. So it's great. And now in New York, you're going to see a lot more uh, of it. So John was the one who brought up ancient world, new world, uh, Whatever. Old world. And, yeah, yeah, old world. When did the United States, when did California, we know that it kind of happened in and around the beginning of the 1800s when we started to plant, but when did we become that powerhouse? When did we usurp those traditional wine fucking gods, particularly France, Italy, and Germany? And there is a definitive answer to that. It was in 1976. 1976, American wines finally gained respect. It was something called the Judgment of Paris in the spring of 1976 when French and American winemakers went head-to-head in the greatest underdog story of the onological world. Onology is the study of wine. So the Judgment of Paris is like after a story from Greek mythology. 
The showdown was run by a legendary British wine merchant named Steve Spurrier. Steve Spurrier. He happened to have died last year, but he was a big-time wine merchant in the U.K. Taking advantage of our bicentennial in 1976, 1776, 1976, Spurrier decided to pit world-renowned French wines up against up-and-coming California wines in a winner-take-all contest. The drinks were judged by a panel of respected wine critics, such as the editor of France's premier wine magazine and the dean of French culinary writers. So this was it. This was the World Series put together by Steve Spurrier, and it was France versus California Reds. The odds were not in for were not in the Americans' favor, right? Pretty much everyone expected the French to clean house because we were such a young wine-producing country, even in 1976. But after the whites, which came first, racist, um, California won three of the top four spots. People were stunned. And Spurrier suddenly feel that the French might lose much more if they were to lose the prestigious red wine competition as well. So in total violation of the rules, he told the judges the results of the white test before the official announcement. Knowing the reputation of French vineyards was on the line, some judges, primarily French ones, tried their hardest to make sure the Americans lost. Despite all of this, the panel chose a California Cabernet as the number one red wine in the world back in 1976 for the first time. So that's when all of a sudden America hit the absolute map. Humiliated, the French hoped the story would silently disappear, but journalist George Tabor covered the incident in Time magazine, sending shockwaves across the culinary world and changing the California wine industry forever, which I'm going out to. Win, uh, for the for the race, right? NASCAR. Yes. NASCAR, and they do it. So the NASCAR is doing all this, like, you know, kitschy stuff. I'm going out to the Coliseum uh, next week because they're doing something in the L.A. Coliseum. They're doing, like, a Bristol night race in the dirt. They're doing all these, like, different road courses and stuff. But I didn't know. They've always gone to Sonoma. They've always gone to Sonoma because there's a track out there. And so I'm covering uh, NASCAR this year in Sonoma, which is going to be quite nice. Myself and Spider. And I think one of the people that's tagged to go along is Casey and perhaps Kelly Keeks. Uh, what, what's Wine Stops. Monaco. I've heard it's the Monaco of NASCAR is what Monaco people are calling NASCAR. it. Absolutely. So I, I have to be there. So we're talking about people who then judged that the United States was a player in the wine game. I will tell you, these people that judge such things, these sommeliers, are absolute bullshit. Earning p the position is tough, right? It takes practice, cultivation of the senses, and all that kind of stuff. But they can be fooled just like anyone else. In 2001, at the University of Bordeaux, they ran a test on 54 onology students. The researcher offered the students two glasses of wine, one red and one white. After taking a sip, they were asked to describe the taste of each. They all described the different grapes and the tannins that they can taste, only they weren't drinking red wine. The researcher had simply put a little bit of red dye in the bottle of white wine, successfully fooling all the students. So it's, if you can't tell the difference between red and white wine, you're full of shit. Like, I mean, that's, that's probably one of the more basic things in the world. And so I think that, like we had said before, it blows everything out of the water if you can convince somebody that a wine is something else. All the students. Not one student got it right. Yes. Not one was like, something's up here. And they found out that researcher at Brock University learned that people are willing to pay at least $2 extra per bottle if the wine has a name that's hard to pronounce, regardless of taste. So if it's Nebuchadnezzar, I'd pay an extra $2 a bottle, right? People tend to pay more for French wines automatically over any other wine and stuff like that. So uh, it's 100% book, book by its cover. Yes, ma'am. I don't know what he's having, but I'll have the Nebuchadnezzar, please. <laughs> the Nebuchadnezzar, yeah. 100. So I think it's one of those things where... Is that, that the name of the ship in the Matrix? I think it might <laughs> What? Be. No, what? Yeah, it is. It is. It is, is it? Yeah, yeah, 100%. That's probably the only reason I know the it. Nebuchadnezzar, that's yeah. right. No, but it's, it's all, Yeah, and, and I'm thinking of it as is in terms of this... Oh, you can't be making fun of me that much, but it's as in terms of the King of Babylon. So I'm like Babylon. Well, maybe the ship is in the Matrix is named after the King of Babylon. No, they all. Yeah, no. Oh, yeah. Or it's, I just didn't come first. I don't oh. think it's the other way around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, twenty standard bottles though. Just I don't know. I guess it had me a little bit. Uh, it had me a little bit. I feel like I feel like the Nebuchadnezzar is like a joke gift. Like I always see those big <laughs> bottles of wine. You know what I mean? Like I don't feel like it's a real. When can you drink it? Yeah. How do you pour it? You got to like have three people to. Yeah, I feel pour like it's for show. You walk into a restaurant, they have them up on the walls. Yeah. And never take them down. They just got probably as a tap. On. 
I don't know if you. Ooh. I don't know if you even seen one. I don't know if we've ever seen one. Yeah, I don't think right? I've seen one that big. No. Yeah, that seems like it's more of a thing for Dubai. Yeah. I'm more intrigued by the Balthazar, to be honest with you. About yeah. The, thank <laughs> you by the way, did you see? I'm googling sommelier scandal because I read an old New York Times article. Right, we talked about it yesterday. Well, what comes up right now is sommeliers are all like apparently, you know, in the sexual abuse like ring. Really? Oh yeah, like there's like story after story after story. <laughs> I'm not laughing at that. I'm just that didn't lots see that taking that twist. Yeah, it's a small community, so like lots of ac- rampant, you know, yeah. behavior. Not good. Small in and around wine. Oh yeah. And yet when I Google that, I'm trying all to I like was wade through crimes. all these articles to find <clears throat> the one that I read. I hear you. Yeah, no, John had read an article because the small A test is something that's uh, taken very seriously, and I think there's only like six given out a year at one point, and there was a huge scandal where some of the names of the bottles were given out beforehand. Mm-hmm. And everybody, even if you had the names or not, uh, their their results were totally disallowed. Like, it was a huge uh, scandal at one point. So it's all bullshit. Um, and speaking of bullshit and shadiness, there have been some big uh, crimes, like we mentioned before, where people have been fooled. So before I'm going to talk to you about crimes, and since we're about to talk about crimes, there's no better na- uh, time than now to talk about Simply Safe. You want to keep your family safe from people trying to sell you bad red wine and also from people who want to come in and take your shit. And there's no better way to do that than with Simply Safe. And Simply Safe are giving our listeners, Twisted History listeners, access to all their New Year's holiday deals, which includes 20% off their award-winning home security and your first month free when you sign up for interactive monitoring service. So I have Simply Safe. They sent it to us. I was able to put it up in about an hour and it's wonderful. You it, it it's a game changer. Nobody shits Nobody lets the dog shit on my lawn anymore. Like little stupid things like that because they see we have the outdoor cameras. Yep. And obviously we just keep the, the – maybe I should just put the sign out there. Keep the sign out there. And I think it keeps people at bay more so than the next house that's filled with shit and doesn't have any kind of outdoor cameras allegedly. So keep your whole family safe with the uh, best home security system of 2021 according to the U.S. News and World Report, and it's probably going to get it again in 2022. We just need a couple more months to get that shit in there. You can easily customize the system for your home online in minutes and get a free custom recommendations. So if you want some peace of mind in 2022, and I think we all need some, go to Simply Safe, S-I-M-P-L-I-Safe.com, simplysafe.com, and use the code TWISTED. SimplySafe.com. It's actually SimplySafe.com slash Twisted. And you'll get 20% off your entire award-winning home security system and your first month free when you sign up for interactive monitoring service. That's SimplySafe.com slash Twisted. 20% off. Go there now. SimplySafe.com slash Twisted. It's crazy. Vips doesn't drink wine. Yeah, not a, not, a, not a guy. Not a guy. Is it the wine taste, or do you just not like wine? Like, if you had, um, if it was, like, I don't so like white. Do scotch. I want right. to do a white. I want to uh, do one of those wine tastings. Well, like, not <coughs> wine tasting. With the like dye? Like the Pepsi challenge. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, to see if you dye. can tell. Yes, yes. Because I, I think I loathe white wine. Yeah. So I, I think I would be able to tell the difference. I, but I don't know the difference between a cab and a Syrah. Mm-hmm. I, get, I get that. But I'm amazed that 54... Like sommeliers couldn't figure it out. Like, yeah, it, it seems like. It's all about I, I want to know. I want to know. It's all bullshit. Yeah, it's all about it's, the um, It's one hundred percent bullshit. But no, I, I, I just don't. I just never got into it. It's the wine taste. But I have had like a nice bottle, of like a hundred and ten dollar wine that was. I could. It was very smooth and it didn't really have like the ah, heavy you have? taste. Like Camus. I have no clue what it was. Uh, but it was. It was long ago. It was long ago enough where I was at uh, the girl this girl's house and I was in my head deciding should I try this dog pain medication while really? with this wine because wow. we're drinking the wine and it was like for a celebratory oh, moment sure. and her dog also had surgery and I was like can can a human take dog medicine that was more what it was it right. wasn't like I want to take these pills it was that more of a, a she was kind of, yeah I was like hey like if this big great da- I go this she had a great day and I go this great dane's like my size like yeah we we've got to be Comparable. on the same like yeah, yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I wouldn't try that, but I didn't. I Anyways. don't think I'm ever going to get to a point, no matter how much wine I drink, that I'd be able to do the, the Pepsi challenge. But I think I know enough right now, as 50-year-old guy who's been drinking wine for the last 30 years or so, uh, I know that, uh, what I like and what I don't. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, th- like, I think if we uh, put, like, a 19 crimes glass and yeah. then tell you next to, like, the prisoner, 
I f- which w- is a blend that we've had together, yep. I feel like you'd be able to tell. Probably, yeah. Or I'd be able – if you put this, even like grape-wise, like a Cabernet or, or this grape, this grape here, which I like, so a Syrah grape, if you put it next to a Grenache, I would tell you that, oh, that's the gr- – part of it is that the color would give it away for me. Yeah. But I, I kind of even know what grapes I stay with. So that's where I'm at. Mm. But otherwise, I don't know anything. I mean, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think a lot of people do. But I'm going to go – so Simply Safe keeps your house safe. I'm going to talk to you about people who got fucked with wines. And one of them was this Romanet Conti. It's a legendary French vineyard. It produces one of the most elegant and extravagantly priced wines in the world. They usually run between like $900 and $1,000 a bottle easily. And a case of the stuff, vintage 1978, sold for $476,000 in 1993. A case of wine for a half a million in 1993. So it's like such staggering prices. The folks at the vineyard wouldn't want anything to happen to their vines. You don't think about that. But then some guy sent him a letter threatening to poison their grapevines, and they freaked out. It was January 2010, and the owner, co-owner of Romani Conti, Aubret de Villain, received a map of his vineyards and a letter demanding 1 million euros. According to the map, the crook had already poisoned two of his vines, and he did. He took DDT... He cut open two of the vines and he injected DDT into the wine into the vines that house the grapes that make this incredibly expensive wine. I feel like isn't that kind of what happened in Auburn with their trees? One hundred percent, the yeah. Auburn yeah. tree. Yeah, that's yeah. psycho of a guy. Yeah, roll tide. Roll tide. Yeah, you don't know that story. It's the guy who he was a Bama fan, or was one hundred percent Bama yeah. fan. And, and he yeah, went he down to it. Auburn after the Iron Bowl victory. Auburn and has these like unique trees that own. I don't know if they only grow there, but they're unique to that area, right? They've they been there. Toilet for, yeah, paper them, right? Don't they do that? Years. Like it's yeah. in the square you there. Do that, but he like yeah. actually poisoned them. And he went in and he and they, poisoned. Like, died. He killed the trees in in Tumor's Corner, I believe, is the name mm-hmm. of the corner of the thing where it was killed. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Tumor's Corner. Because I followed that guy. He was a psychopath. What do you mean you followed him on like Twitter? On Twitter, the guy yeah. who did it, the Roll Tide guy who did it, was a psychopath for Alabama football, and obviously, biggest uh, rivalry in college sports is arguably Alabama, Auburn, the Iron Bowl, and stuff like that. But that's what this guy was doing. So he's essentially holding this uh, vineyard for ransom with the threat of poisoning more, and it's very tough to police such a large vineyard. Large vineyard. And I guess I could poison it very easily. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It seems very easily. That guy was a Texas State trooper who did it. Oh, yeah? That's what was bad. his name? His name was, um, he called himself Al from Dadeville. Hmm. I think I followed him then. That doesn't sound from but maybe. This is Al from Dadeville. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> this, guy, this guy says, hey, listen, I already poisoned two grapes, uh, two grapevines. I did it. And I have this map. This is your shit. I'm going to poison more. Give me a million euros. Sorry. Harvey cool. Updike. Harvey Updike's the go. guy that I followed. Yeah. That's the go. dude. Harvey Updike. Give me a million euro, euros or I'm going to poison the rest of your thing. They went to the police. They set up camp around a cemetery where the blackmailer demanded someone stuff cash in a suitcase, meet him by this graveyard. Police set up this big sting operation. And sure enough, they drop off a case of plain paper. The guy comes out, grabs it. Police get him. The blackmailer was named Jacques Soltis, and he'd gotten this crazy scheme from a cellmate in prison. He'd just gotten out of prison. Soltis later committed suicide when he was sent back to jail, and his son Cedric, who acted as his accomplice, served eight months in prison for his role in the affair. So Jacques, Jacques Soltis had, uh, had bit the big one after trying to poison the, uh, the vineyards at Romani Conti, one of the finest uh, wines in the world. Jails are just think tanks for... What can criminals I to, to make bad ideas. Out. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because all these all these people are just showing up and just giving all their bad ideas, and then they get better at crime. I got terrible news. This wine's starting to grow on me. Uh oh. So as I, as I, I don't along. think it's awful. I said you got to give it an hour to. <laughs> yeah, it's starting to grow on me. Good Let call. her breathe. See she that? knows wine. Good call, lady. Nine ninety nine. By the way, <laughs> so how about that that two buck chuck? Do you know about that? The the two like I've I said nine ninety nine. Yeah. Uh, so the. The Trader Joe's is like two buck chuck. It's exactly it. So this two buck chuck, I think it's now two ninety nine, but it's like Charles Shaw wine. So aka two buck chuck, and it's a cheap wine. But there were all these rumors floating around why it was so cheap, including one that after nine eleven, 
they were no longer allowed to keep corkscrews in airplanes. Right. So all these airlines used to serve two buck chuck, so they had such a surplus of it that they had to try and sell for two dollars a piece. And it's not true. I thought that was a weird like kind of thing. To, like two buck chuck, it was like widely known <laughs> that it was an airline thing that all of a sudden after nine eleven because there's corkscrews, so they dropped the price. That's kind of fucking. That, that is a weird rumor. People make shit up. Yeah. And there was another one that the guy Charles Shaw or whoever owned the uh, winery, he had like a divorce proceeding where his wife was getting the wine business. So he, before he left, he dropped the price to two dollars just to fuck her in the divorce proceedings. And neither of those are true. It does cost like two bucks or two dollars and ninety nine cents, but it was only because they produce it in such huge volume that they're able to keep their prices down. People love scandal. Scandal sells. And in two thousand four, two buck chuck won the top prize at the twenty eighth annual International Eastern Wine Competition, where it beat out twenty three hundred other wines. Let's try it. Two buck chuck. I don't know, I've, I've had it. I've opened it up a couple of times. It's a good cheap wine, but it just goes to show you. Like you're spending thousands of dollars, or at least I am, a year on wines, and Two Buck Chuck is, is tonning it. So in the late 80s, there's a billionaire named William Koch, or Koch. How do you want to pronounce the, that? Uh, K-O-C-H. The, the, the Koch brothers. Koch, yeah. brothers yeah. Koch brothers. Who is currently worth $2.1 billion. His father, Fred Koch, created an improved method of refining heavy oil into gasoline. So the Koch brothers. Ironically, he, hasn't this family dabbled on historically both sides of the aisle, right? They've, I mean, they're big... Uh, Donors. Yeah, 100%. There also, uh, there was some real strife between the brothers, and so there was various split-ups into a bunch of different companies. We could do and the history of the Coke brothers. We could do it, yeah. Coke fun. brothers, yeah. Um, he bought four big bottles of wine for $500,000 in the late 80s. Four bottles of wine, $500,000. The bottles came from a collection owned by a dude who was big in the German music scene and was also a collector, and his name was Harry Hardy Rodenstock, who claimed he discovered them in a hidden Parisian cellar, and according to Rodenstock, most of the do- bottles dated back to 1787, and they happened to have once belonged to someone named Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States. And it sort of rung true, because Jefferson spent a lot of time in Paris. There's a movie, Jefferson in Paris. He spent a lot of time in uh, vineyards in and around France, and he was a huge onophile. The reason the state of Virginia is the sixth biggest state for the numbers of wineries in the U.S. is because of Thomas Jefferson. But I can't remember ever having a wine from Virginia, except for the one from the Trump wine. Oh, oh. Them, they're okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's all sweet I mean. wines. It's, you know, like yeah. strawberry wines popular in the South. So Somebody it's... sent me a Trump one as a goof. I had it, and it was okay, but I remember it's from Virginia. I don't yeah. know. But California's number one, Oregon, Washington, New York, Texas, and then Virginia. Seems like it's not out of place, but one of the reasons is is that uh, Jefferson was so huge. Yeah. He used to keep detailed descriptions of all his French wines that he owned, and he often supplied George Washington with the very best stuff. But when the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston was getting ready to display Coke's collection of wines, Fine Arts in Boston, they were like, fuck it, we'll put this up. Are you kidding me? What, what are you saying, John? No, sorry. I was just uh, There's wine in New Jersey. I'm so, they're probably like 8th or 11th on that <coughs> list, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That kind of stands to reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, New Jersey makes an okay wine. Yeah, uh, they're sweeter, I feel like, when you get into Jersey and Virginia. It's like a sweeter port wine. North Fork of Long Island. Yeah. North Fork of Long Island has a couple of wineries. Mm-hmm. They're everywhere. Indiana's got some. <laughs> Oliver Winery, just yeah. right off 37. Yeah, we got our own winery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Probably one of the finest wines in the world, yeah, right? That Bloomington wine, it's good. That, that good southern Indiana wine. The pride of Goshen, Indiana, Rick Myrer, mm-hmm. just started his wine label, Play Like a Champion, today. It's a shout-out for Rick Myrer. He's quarterback when I went to college. I mean, that's Goshen, Indiana. Yeah, yeah. Goshen. Yeah. The <laughs> Goshen motion. Isn't it interesting that those guys, that, that often falls into the cheap wine categories like anybody famous, except for, I would say, like Coppola. He's probably got the biggest like brand name for wine that would – Command a price, but Drew Bledsoe has a wine. Drew Bledsoe, I was gonna say, like, I didn't want to mention it, but he's yeah. that's probably like. A but I think the only reason we bottle of wine, I don't I'm know, telling you why, Rick's minutes? not. Rick's is not. What is it? Fifty? Like, yeah, I think Rick's is fifty and up. Because yeah. I was gonna do a wine tasting with me and Chief for it, mm-hmm. and uh, I feel like Dave Matthews is right around like. Oh, is 30. it cheap? I don't know. Cheapo I th- Charlie. I think so. Really? Because I know the Snoop Dogg one. So this is the same bottle of 19 Crimes. You put Snoop Dogg on it, goes from 9.99. 
to thirteen ninety nine dollars a shot. Get the fuck out. Snoop yeah. Dogg bum. <laughs> yeah. So this guy buys four <laughs> bottles he thinks are from Thomas Jefferson. The Museum of Fine Arts in Boston is getting ready to display these things, mm-hmm. and they learn some disturbing news. According to the folks at Monticello who possessed Jefferson's onological notes, the ex-president had never purchased that particular kind of wine. And suddenly it looked like Hardy Rodenstock had conned Bill Koch out of a half a million dollars. So wanting to know if he'd been duped, Koch hired former FBI agents to investigate the Jefferson bottles. He put together a crack team of super sleuths that included people from Scotland Yard. And they started digging around trying to find proof of the wine's vintage. The trick was doing it in such a way that they didn't have to open the bottle and ruin the contents. Again, this bottle was supposedly from the 1700s. That's when they learned about a French physicist named Philippe Hubert. You would say Hubert, because you guys aren't like me. Hubert? Uh, Yeah, so Philippe Hubert, who could determine the age of the wine in question, and he could do it, this is why I'm telling the story, because of the atomic bomb. Do you know about this at all? Uh Uh-uh. So this guy, Hubert, was a French physicist. When the first atomic bombs went off in the 1940s, they unleashed a totally new radioactive isotope called cesium-137. Before 1945, cesium-137 simply did not exist. But today, it's everywhere. It's inside of Vibs right now. And if Hubert could prove that there was cesium-137 inside of the wine, he would know that it was bottled after 1945 and this whole thing was a fucking hoax. So sure enough, he tests the bottles of wine with a gamma ray detector that was in a laboratory under the Swiss Alps that was specially covered in lead that was smelted by the ancient Romans. I like that story. That sounds like a James Bond. That's awesome. Right? Base, and yeah. that's how he's tasting the wine. There wasn't any cesium-137 to be found, so the wine was bottled between 1945. So it looks like maybe the Coke guy wasn't ripped off. However, after more digging, because there was, there was engraved on each bottle THJ, which obviously stood for Thomas Jefferson. But after extensive investigation, the team discovered that those letters had been engraved by an electric dentistry tool, by a fucking Dremel, which obviously didn't exist in the mid-18th century. Right. So, with evidence in hand, Bill Koch launched eight lawsuits against Hardy Rodenstock and his cohorts, and the suit cost the billionaire about $25 million, but he managed to recoup some of his losses when the court awarded him $12 million in damages. Lost 500000 got back $12 million, spent $25 million to do it. Not a great investment, but he made a point. You'd think Thomas Jefferson would just sign his name TJ, not You'd T-H. Think. Yeah, what a dot jerk off, right? J- yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But they got the cesium-137, and they found out it was just done with, like, you know, something you bought at Home Depot. Mm-hmm. That's a happy ending. Who makes an investment that large without authenticating it? Everybody. First? This guy, Rudy Kurniawan. He was an Indonesian guy. He was a con man. Rudy Kurniawan. Tens of million dollars off of counterfeit wine. He's the subject of a 2016 documentary called Sour Grapes because in 2012, <laughs> he was unmasked as a master counterfeiter of the rarest bottles. He reminds me of that um, catch me if you can type guy. Mm-hmm. His wealthy victims, confident they were too smart to be fooled, purchased an astonishing $30 million of faux wine from him. Nearly every bottle had been fashioned by his own hand. If they went, when they raided his apartment, it was stacks and stacks of ancient like, you know, old bottles that he had sitting there collecting dust purposely that he would then fill with wine that he mixed himself, cork, and then label with labels that he had made himself as a master forger. He was the only only person ever prosecuted by the federal authorities for selling fake wine. Only person in history. Because of the Hammurabi Code, it kept people kind of on their feet. Mm -hmm. In November 2020, after a sentence and has served in a Texas prison, where he remained for over seven years, he was sent, uh, he was released, and then deported to Indonesia. And normally, when ICE deports you back, they buy the uh, the ticket. He's like, no, and he bought himself a first class ticket instead. And now it's believed that he has as many as ten thousand counterfeit bottles still in private collections. So people just want to have people just want to have these things with the fancy label, the Opus ones, and all the the Romani, Kobe, whatever all over their stuff, and it probably doesn't even matter whether or not it's true. And the same could be said about the art world, I guess. Um, I'm going to move to something a little bit weird. We're going to do some weird wine. 
I'm a big sake guy. I'm a big sake guy. Sake is a fermented rice wine, yep. and it has its origins in ancient Japan, um, and those origins aren't hygienic. This is something I think you should do. There's a couple of – everything from here on out I think you should do uh, for um, – Lowering the bar, if that's okay. Absolutely. Am I allowed I, we, to say that to you? No, we need ideas. So the thing is, rice starch has to be broken down in some way before it can be fermented, right? So in the sake making process, you have to break down the rice starch in order to make this right, rice wine. The process is actually closer to it being a rice beer, but I digress. So you still have to break this down. And they found the perfect way to do it was with human saliva. So they'd have masticating people, just chewing people, that would take their rice, chew, get some saliva into it, spit it into a pot where the saliva would break down the starches within. And the particular mouths that chewed the rice actually became part of the Shinto religious ritual. Only young virgins, so Annie, you're out, were allowed to chew the rice. These virgins were considered mediums of the gods, and the sake they produced was called Bijin Shu, or beautiful woman sake. You're back in. The Bijin Shu process was particularly popular for weddings, and though it's no longer mainstream practice, in remote parts of Japan and Taiwan today, you can still find women sitting around a large bowl, chewing, spitting rice, and then distilling uh, sake from the spit-out rice starches. Would, would you rather people chew your rice, spit it out, yes. or people stomp on your grapes with their bare feet, dirty feet? It's an excellent question. That's, a, uh, that's an excellent question. Because so I think the, feet are a little more gross than the mouth. You're absolutely uh, – yeah. yeah. D- depending on who it depending is. Depending on the feet or the mouth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean I guess there's a, there's a certain um, – I, you know, I, I'd probably go with the mouth. So I think to even have the finest Japanese virgin – they didn't even say it necessarily was going to be guys uh, – kind of chew it out and then spit it out and you make it from it, I would do it. Throughout medieval Europe, wine was seen as universal pick-me-up. For women wishing to conceive a boy, the Trotula, a 12th century collection of Italian gynecological texts. I have it right next to the bed, the Trotula. Mm-hmm. Every time I look yeah. at it, just get some tips. Mm-hmm. It recommended that in order to have a son, husbands had to drink wine mixed with dried rabbit womb and vagina. It's tough to come by. So almost like rabbit vagina <laughs> jerky. While the bride had to drink that same wine, but instead with dried rabbit testicle. How the hell did that make it in there? I just threw that in. And then we're going to talk. We're going to talk about some of the weirdest wines in the world. But before I do that, I'm going to tell you about one of the greatest deals in the world. It is now the end of January. Don't be an idiot. Get it done. Get it done. It's going to be February 14th. In the drop of a hat, it's Valentine's Day. Go to 1-800-Flowers. 1-800-Flowers.com. I already did it for my mom. And he's not a big flowers person. I I, I just did mine two days ago for yeah. my mom. Yep. 100. It's the it's the easy – and by the way, if you set up an account with these people, 1-800-Flowers.com, if you set up an account with them, they send you reminders, birthdays, the whole deal. It is press nice. and play, absolute idiotic thing. And I'm telling you, your brother didn't do it. My brother didn't do it. No, and they're beautiful. 100%. They, their presentation when they get delivered is very nice. Yeah. So they gave they gave us something. So it's a uh, full spectrum of sort of roses, timeless red. But, Can't go wrong with 1-800-Flowers. You can order 24 assorted roses for $40 and upgrade to 24 red roses for only $10 more. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com, click the radio icon, and enter the code TWISTED. 1-800-Flowers.com, code TWISTED. But it's Wednesday that we're recording. It'll be out tonight or tomorrow. This expires after Friday. This expires after Friday, which is like January 28th. So you got to jump on this yep. now. You can go and spend 40 bucks and send your mom, your loved one, your aunt, your anybody. 24 assorted roses for 40 bucks. I think that's a fantastic thing. I wouldn't upgrade to red roses because I think the assorted roses is a nice thing, particularly to you send your mom and my mom. And I'm going to do both. I only did my mom because I like them more. You go, go <laughs> yeah, go assorted roses, 39.99. That's a great deal. Maybe uh, throw in a vase for a couple more bucks. Perfect. Yeah, throw in but some flowers. You some do this now. Yeah. Last Valentine's Day, I waited to like three, four days before Valentine's Day to send my mom flowers. Couldn't get it done. Couldn't you, send it to him to her on Valentine's you, Day. You cannot like listen. The paint your life thing that we talked about earlier. It takes some time. Like, if you yeah. want that to be there by Valentine's Day, you might be holding your hat. Try it. I mean, you know, they say around two weeks, and if you don't have, like, a lot of Andre the Giant type stuff to really do, then you might get it done. Uh, every plate, 
that thing, that can happen right away. And obviously, it's one of those things that you'll be using every day. 1-800-Flowers is one of these things where you have to jump on it because of the supply chain issues. It's the same thing I said with every plate. When you go in and the, and the, and the cupboards are bare, you don't have to worry about that with every plate. With 1-800-Flowers, you don't have to worry about going to your florist. If you go into a florist right now, it is fucking depressing. There's nothing on the shelves. It is like we're in the siege of Leningrad. Yeah. 100%. Yes. I don't know what it is. The siege of Leningrad. 1-800-Flowers.com. Uh, code twisted. Offer expires Friday. We're about to get out of here, but I'm going to go through some of the weirdest wines in the world. One of them has got to be this one that I like. It's called Pruno. You make it in prison. It's also known as Hooch. It's also known as Raisin Jack. It's also known as Toilet Wine. Some guy named Jarvis J. Masters, who's a death row inmate, he's still alive. He, uh, he killed a prison guard. He was in San Quentin. He wrote a poem on how to make this, if you want to know it. But it's apples and oranges, fruit cocktail, fruit juices, hard candy, ketchup, and crumbled bread. This is what they do to do this. You line the inside the cell of your toilet, uh, the, the, the wall of your cell toilet. You line it with a thick, durable plastic bag. You put all those ingredients in it. Apples, oranges, the fruit cocktail cups, hard candy, sugar, high fructose corn syrup, ketchup, and crumbled bread from your sandwiches. Put them all inside there. You put them all into a pillowcase. You pound it into a pulp. Tie that off, the sock of the pillowcase, with all the pulp. You put that into the plastic bag with hot water inside your toilet. That's what's going to start the fermentation process. You, you let that bag sit for approximately a week. Ventilation is important, so every now and again you need to burp the bag, even though it can smell pretty foul. <laughs> what comes out after you remove all the pulp is an alcohol that ranges somewhere around a 14% ABV, which is what we have here. So it's not something that gets you there quick. It's not like Louisiana Lightning. And it looks it's supposed to be like a bile-flavored wine cooler. And it's absolutely disgusting, but if made right, you can get up to $50 a bag while in prison. That's good money. And it might stop you from getting raped by a dude. <laughs> right? I, I, I see no, no cons to this. There is no cons to this. But they're even made in, like, juvie halls now. So it's called Pruno, and anyone can make it. Right? Uh, meteorite wine. Bottle in 2012. Some guy in South America has a vineyard, and right next to the vineyard, he owns an observatory. Those are his two loves is astronomy and wine. So he went out and he bought a meteorite from a private coll collector and he uh, makes a wine that he stores in a barrel with parts of the meteorite and then sells to people. The idea behind the project was to blend his passion and to give everybody the chance to touch an element of space and taste particles of the birth of the solar system via a good handcrafted wine. The uh, meteorite that he has in there is estimated to be 4.5 billion years old. So you can buy something called Meteor Meteorito. It costs $15 a bottle, but it's tough to get unless you visit uh, Chile, right? So there's Meteorito, which is easy that I would uh, definitely drink this. Three Penis Wine. That's another one. It's a Chinese Ooh. concoction that's brewed with not one, not two, but three different penises. Mine, John, and Jeff's. A seal <laughs> penis... Mine, a deer penis, John's, and a Cantonese dog penis. Jeff's, that's what I like to think of what yours looks like, a Cantonese dog penis. Like a tube yeah. of lipstick. And it's a mean <laughs> – it gives a drinker that extra be a boost of uh, vitality that sometimes a human penis cannot get on its own. It's not hard to get. It can be found in supermarkets across Shanghai. This is the one that I'm going to try to get for you, Jeff, the next one. The baby mice wine which is in China and Korea, and it's made from fermented baby mice, believed to be an effective health tonic, particularly in rural Korea. It's made by dropping live mice, just two or three days old, into a bottle of rice wine, and they're left to stew for around a year before you strain it and consume it. I would do that. Would you do it? I, oh, I would drink it in a second. I wouldn't make it. The Making it sounds like a nightmare. Yeah, the resulting beverage is said to taste not unlike gasoline. And I think the last one that I'm going to do. Sold me on that. Yeah, yeah. Is the uh, is Tong Sul. Tong Sul is feces wine. It originated from Korea and it's said to be made by submerging a bamboo stick in a chamber pot which contains shit and alcohol and leaving it there for several months to ferment. After which the mixture is removed from the bamboo stick. Another less time consuming method is to simply mix alcohol with shit for several days. 
The rice, wine, the rice wine drink all but died in the 1960s, but was once considered an effective treatment for cuts, bruises, and a host of other ailments, included curing epilepsy. So I'll end on that. I'll end on shit wine called Tang Sul, which originated from Korea. And I would tell you right now that even though, and I have tiger bone wine where they put the whole tiger in a fucking vat of rice wine. Um, I had that shit that Pope Leo did, which wound up being 7% cocaine. Maybe we'll mention like that. it top of the next episode. Absolutely. Why wouldn't me? Uh, but that's it. That's the twisted history of uh, wine. It was me. It was Jeff. It was John. It was Annie. And we're still fucking around with that thing, that two cents. So if you guys want to try that out, it's www dot two cents the number two c-e-n-t-s dot audio slash twisted and you can give us feedback and you can give us recommendations for what to do in the future yeah if you leave a good one we'll probably try and put it in the show yeah we're gonna try again connect it to the show and whatnot so that's it for us with twisted history thank you everybody for listening and we'll see you guys next week